New visitors from the portal, coaches' tease and secret commitments, and presser interviews from Nebraska's coordinators made for an exciting first week of this new year. After a strong December, Matt Rule and the new staff are closing out their first ever recruiting class, and with holes on the line and at receiver, I'm expecting at least four more transfers to come in before it's all said and done. And as great as it's been to see all the additions to the roster, just as important is how the offense and defense will look come game day. And after weeks of speculation, we finally got some valuable insight on how both these coaches plan to build their units over the next eight months. I've got plenty of thoughts on what's been going on this past week, so today I'm breaking down the latest transfer portal news and I'll give you my thoughts on the recent comments from Tony White and Marcus Satterfield. But what's up guys, I'm Connor Hayden and this is Corn Craze. If you're a fan of Nebraska or the Big Ten, make sure you hit the subscribe button below to help us get to 17,000. And if you're excited to see a fullback in this new offense, hit the like button now to help us hit 1,000. But now, let's get into it. I want to start off with the three transfer portal visitors from this week. They had Micah Mazuka from Baylor, Billy Kemp from Virginia, and Walter Roos from Stanford. And all three of them would make an impact day one. Mike is a 6'5", 330-pound guard who started 10 games this year and ranked in the top 25 nationally by PFF as a run-blocking interior lineman. And on three has him ranked in the top 10 at his position in the entire portal, so to say he's a priority would be an understatement. He's announced in this Tuesday, and he also has Florida and Auburn in that final three, but all signs point to him choosing Nebraska, and he'll probably compete for a starting guard spot against Nwili, Latovsky, and Corcoran. And the other lineman who came for a visit was tackle Walter Ruse from Stanford, who started 39 games in his career. Kentucky, Iowa, and OU are all in on him too, and the realist in me just can't imagine that Nebraska locked in two portal linemen in one week. So for right now, I'm just going to assume he's not in. But on three has him ranked as the 19th best tackle in the portal. So I'm sure if he did end up coming, he would start day one. But for right now, Rule's only got a 30% chance to land him. And the last visitor from this week was Billy Kemp from Virginia, who on three lists is a lock to sign with Nebraska. He's played both running back and receiver, but he spent the last two years out wide, and he averaged about 45 total yards a game in the last four seasons. And if you haven't gotten a chance to watch his highlights yet, imagine what you thought Elante Brown was going to look like in the Scott Frost offense back before he took his first snaps. That's Billy Kemp. One of the most important things he's looking for is the opportunity to be the number one target. And because Nebraska can offer that, I'm pretty sure he'll end up signing sometime in the next few weeks. There will still be questions this spring about which six are going to get the most time in the rotation, but Kemp would battle with Washington and Fleeks to be the go-to receiver for whoever ends up as QB1. He's not a recent visitor, but it sounds like Malik Hornsby was set to sign with Nebraska a couple of weeks back before both UNLV and Houston came calling, and then it started to feel like he was going to try to go to a smaller school and get a second chance at quarterback. Then Friday, two days ago, on three crystal ball into Nebraska, and they changed his position from QB to receiver. And I've talked to multiple sources who've been really confident this past week that he's going to end up signing with Nebraska. But then I just saw on Twitter, like 30 minutes ago, that there's a new crystal ball in for Texas State, where he took a visit to yesterday. So at this point, I'd say it's more than likely he ends up at Texas State since he keeps flirting with this idea of being a quarterback. But if he does end up signing with Nebraska, the best receiver comparison I can give you is Xavier Betts. He's got the same build, similar speed. I'm just not sure how he'd be as a route runner and if he could earn playing time right away or if he'd need another season to develop. And speaking of Xavier Betts, I saw that he entered the portal to find a place to restart his career that honestly started off pretty well, considering he did play in the Scott Frost offense. Now, you might call me crazy, but just consider this scenario. You're Matt Rule, and you've got a fetish for speed. Xavier Betts lives down the street, and the last time he played football, he averaged 13 yards a catch, and he torched defenders at Penn State and OU in two of his first eight games. You've got Washington, Brown, Belt, Kemp, and a couple true freshmen like Coleman who will try to make a move and play early. But there's a proven starter in Betts looking for a second chance. So if you're Coach Rule, do you call Xavier and ask if he's ready to get his life back on track with a new culture at his original home? Or do you let that one go and hope you can develop some of the young guys who are already in that room? 
We know this staff wants to keep all of the in-state talent in-state. So I'll tell you right now, I will not be surprised if Xavier Betts somehow makes his way back into this conversation. I finally got a chance to watch the latest press conference this afternoon, so let's talk about the four things I learned from Nebraska's new offensive coordinator. Number one, receiver depth isn't where it needs to be. We talk a lot about the line being questionable and how important it'll be to remake that into a serviceable unit, but until this week with the talk around some of the transfers at receiver, I haven't heard too much about the current group. Satterfield made a point that the depth was thin and the most important thing to take into account was that you need different types of receivers to make up each position. Ideally, the offense has a big body possession receiver who can win a contested ball, a speed guy who can win over the top, and a slot guy who can rack up yards after the catch and play kind of like a running back. Marcus Washington, Elante Brown, and Brody Belt are the three main contributors returning, and they all possess a similar skill set. So developing some of the young guys early is going to be a key to the offense's success going forward. Number two, the huddle's making a comeback. It's been a long time since I stood in the huddle during a football game. Probably haven't done that since I was about 12 years old. But as I listened to the OC describe why it's such an important part of the game, I started to remember my own experiences. Satterfield believes in the huddle because it gives the QB a chance to lead and to communicate with every guy in the offense before they head out to run a play as a unit. And in the modern offense, we just see the entire group look to a play card or a hand signal on the sideline, the QB claps his hands, and they repeat that process all game. There's no real leadership or one-on-one -on -one opportunity to connect as a group and talk about individual assignments unless it's after a drive. He didn't say this in the presser, but a huddle slows the game down quite a bit, and it can significantly reduce the play count, which will make this 2023 offense look a lot more like the Iowa and Wisconsin teams we've seen in the past. Less possessions and less plays, but also less opportunities for the opponents to get the ball and ultimately wear down the defense. Number three, Nebraska's finally going to have a fullback. One of the most popular Satterfield comments that got shared around social media was about running a pro-style offense with tight ends and the fullback. And when I went and watched the presser, I heard him tell reporters to go and watch the first play he called when he was at Tennessee Chattanooga back in 2011 for the season opener at Nebraska. So I went and did that. And what was it? A fullback dive right up the middle for a four-yard gain. So the question is, who plays fullback this year? Well, if I had to make a prediction, I'm going to guess that they move one of the tight ends over for now, and then in the future, they're going to actually start recruiting for that position. And number four, Satterfield will make the O-line a priority. I was surprised with how open he was about the initial meeting with Rayola because he basically said he was looking for reasons to not like the guy and that the expectation was to bring in a more familiar name who could coach that group. But after their first meeting, Satterfield was thoroughly impressed with Rayola's approach and how much he loved Nebraska. And he quickly became his biggest advocate and he pushed Matt Rule to make him part of this next staff. Now, Sat was an assistant O-line coach at Carolina, so he was able to learn more about technique, verbiage, and how to call an offense that'll work with the line. And I think one of the biggest issues Rayola faced last year was that Whipple called the offense the way he wanted, but the O-line might have been put in bad spots since he didn't incorporate their strengths into that game plan. And Satterfield's experience coaching every position on the offense is only going to help him to understand the strengths and ultimately make the group more efficient. Now let's hop over to the defense and talk about what I learned from Tony White in his interview. Number one, there's plenty of returning talent to work with. White implied it's normal to assume you're inheriting scraps in a coaching change like Nebraska's experiencing, but that he's seen a lot to be excited about. And the group that gets the most love, especially since the 3-3-5 requires strong second level play, are the linebackers. And he mentioned Henrich and Reimer by name as guys who the defense can build around in the first year. All four starting DBs return, along with Huttmacher and Ty Robinson on the line. So as long as they can learn their role in the new system, this first year defense will feature plenty of talent. Number two, the black shirts will make a return. We just don't know when. Every staff has their own ideas for when and how to distribute them. And one of the best things Mickey did as a head coach last year was take them away altogether. There are some traditions that are so special, your most important job as a coach is to protect it at all costs so it doesn't lose its value. 
And Tony White understands this as much as any Nebraska fan does. So he said he won't make any decisions on black shirts until he talks to former players and coaches about the significance and the meaning and learns the right way to handle such a meaningful honor. Number three, the 335 isn't the only front they'll line up in. There's still a ton of questions about how the defense will look come week one, but one of the most important points White covered is that they won't be limited to a three-man front. They can use four or five down linemen depending on what the offense comes out in, and the linebacker count will just drop as they move the bigger bodies up to the line. Even if the base D calls for a front six instead of a front seven, the staff's going to adjust their play calls and the formations to fit the personnel they have currently. And over time, they'll recruit to fill the roles for their base formation. And last at number four, although they're young, this staff's proven. White emphasized the importance of being a great recruiter if you're going to be a part of Matt Rule's staff. And based on what we've seen so far and what we saw on all these new hires' resumes, that point holds true. As fans, we love seeing the big-time commitments and the jump to the top of the class rankings, but in the back of most of our heads, we still get nervous about how good the staff can be with such limited experience over these past couple years. Two names Tony mentioned that bring a lot to the table were Terrence Knighton and Evan Cooper, who both came over from the Panthers staff, and their experience working with NFL guys and competing against elite talent like Joe Burrow and Tom Brady make them more than qualified to lead their position groups at Nebraska. Rules coached the D-line, and White's worked with both linebackers and DBs, so if there was any drop-off in ability for any position coach, they'll be mentored by guys who've been successful as assistants in the past and can get this staff up to speed pretty quick. We talk about splash hires and want to believe that whoever has the biggest name or the most recent success is the right guy for the job, but looking back at Mark Whipple and how much this offense struggled last year, it's apparent that it takes the right team of coaches to make the entire unit work and that one good play caller isn't enough to fix all the issues. The most important thing I learned from these interviews was that Rule chose coaches who believe in his vision and who understand what it takes to execute his plan. So for the first time in years, it'll feel like a more collaborative effort. But I want to know what you think, so let me know in the comments below. Are you excited to get back to a huddle, or do you think that's taking a step backwards now that the modern offense avoids that step? Should the black shirts be handed out before week one, or do you think they need to play a few games first to find out who deserves to wear them? And which transfers do you think are going to sign with Nebraska this next week? If I had to guess, I would say Kemp and Mazuka. and if Matt Rule's interested, probably even Xavier Betts. But that's all I've got for today, so thank you for being here, and I'll see you in the next one. Go Big Red.